Okay. So, good afternoon. Thank you for joining uh, the, the session. My name is Alberto, and today we are going to talk about uh, this uh, unsupervised free cat. A cat is uh, not only the animal, but in this case, is the software, how we call that in the translation, language translation industry, the software to translate. I'm 36 years old. I started working uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, I've been at the university, I'm a master in computer science, uh, and I'm working uh, most of my career in startups. During the day, I look after uh, as a SRE in the DevOps uh, business unit of the company who sent me here, SourceSense, and also I'm a machine learning uh, uh, manager for the, uh, the unit. Uh, my forte is in Kubernetes, monitoring, uh, uh, continuous integration, cloud, uh, Hadoop, uh, so big data, Python, uh, everything which is uh, around uh, Jupyter Notebooks, scikit-learn, and so forth. At night, I attend in the spare time that I have two metal concerts. And there's something here. This diapositiva one is just uh, really annoying. Okay, it, it won't go away. Okay, very good. <laughs> Great. So I would like to thank also my, the company who's uh, sending me here. Uh, it's SourceSense. We are basically a consulting company completely devoted to open source software. We've been existing since 20 years and we have uh, various branches in Italy, also one in London, so no, so no more in Europe. And uh, we, are, uh, we are DevOps people, we are uh, coders, uh, we are data scientists, uh, and so we take after 360 degrees of everything we can. So today the outline is as, as it follows. So we're starting with the need for a standard tool chain for uh, uh, translating and localizing, as we say, a uh, software project. Then I will uh, talk about the cat tool I'm bringing here today, which is MateCat. And uh, what's the problem with today's uh, machine translation, which is the most fundamental supporting system uh, for a, a translation pipeline? And uh, what is the solution which is, uh, is coming to the rescue? And uh, what we have here practically. So, so why do we need a standard tool chain? Although there are a lot of solutions out there to translate uh, uh, documents uh, and uh, software, most importantly, it feels that too many times uh, we have too many ways to skin the very same cat. And this is because uh, uh, a lot of people are not into the translation industry, so who doesn't understand reinvents from, from scratch? And this is always very dangerous because it fragments the uh, the efforts. And so uh, the software industry, and particularly the FOSS uh, industry, needs to adapt more to the industrial way of doing things, which is the only one viable one. And this is because the industry actors, which are the language service providers, the LSPs, uh, have long set onto a consolidated set of processes, uh, of technologies, and file formats. Uh, there's all, even a consortium which is called OASIS, uh, which standardizes the file formats and uh, the in interchange uh, technologies uh, that allows to build uh, a viable industry for the translation. This presentation so, is about exposing uh, battle-tested technologies to the community so we can return back soon to what we love, which is hacking and not coming up with new ways uh, of uh, translating a software or translating a document. So the standard tool chain for a translation, uh, for a translation company or a transla uh, an open source project that wants to be translated starts with a CAT, a computer-aided translation tool, which is an editor that parses uh, a bilingual file. A bilingual file is a, a kind of an envelope container uh, which represents a file which, uh, which is in the process of being translated. So you put this file in this envelope, everything is extracted, and uh, you can manipulate uh, the strings, uh, which is the text, uh, the buttons, text, the labels, uh, the menu voices, but even a simple docx document. Uh, you can manipulate these strings into other languages. Uh, and uh, uh, among other things, uh, uh, it has to provide the two main capabilities, which is the tag editing capability. Uh, so you can manipulate the, the untranslatable entities like markup. 
if you think about it, uh, a lot of the, the content uh, in a well-formatted file is the formatting, which has nothing, is, doesn't, doesn't need to be translated. You must not translate that, you must preserve it, otherwise you, you're going to break the markup. And so you have to manipulate that, that thing, leaving that untouched. And also, number two, format preservation. So you must convert from the original file to a bilingual uh, system. Then you have to translate all the strings, and then you can pack the strings back in the original file format, preserving the formatting. You don't want to break the file just because you change the strings. Another really fundamental component uh, is the presence of a translation memory. You can think of translation memory uh, as a database of past translations that you can recycle or adapt for the incoming document which is coming here. And uh, the idea is that uh, once you uh, translate something, you don't throw away all the uh, singular translations, uh, but you keep them because the next time you're gonna make a second revision, for example, of dishwashing machine manual, you just want to reuse the very same sentences and just translate new ones. It's a matter of style guide. It's a matter of preserving the experience. Like uh, uh, control panel from Windows in Italy is pannello di controllo. You cannot change that sentence to something else. Otherwise, uh, all the window users who are custom at the kind of uh, uh, sentence appearing somewhere in the menu will be confused if you change to somebody else, like uh, uh, pannello, I don't know, pale control, I don't know, for the control. So you must preserve the style, you must preserve everything that uh, is part of the experience of the software. And translation memory serves this purpose. And last but not least component, you need a machine translation, which is a server that provides translations on the fly, which is Google Translate, for example. So some dominant standards which are worth knowing is the XLIF, which is the Exchange Localization uh, File Format, which is an XML-based uh, file envelope that separates the strings from the markup. So you put a docx into an XLIF envelope, then you have a, a, like the blob, the binary of the original file, who has been processed by removing all the strings and substituting that with placeholders. Then the placeholders are into a map that uh, maps towards the strings. You have them for the original language you are coming from, but then you can add uh, new keys for the other languages you want to uh, go into. And so whenever you want to translate a document, for example, in English, you just add the keys for the English to that map, then you pack uh, telling the software to read only the keys in that language code, and packs back the translated strings into the original document. So replace the, the placeholders with the new strings. All the document is saved and what you end up with is a file format with different language, which fits like kind of magic the first time you see it. I'm gonna show it here. Then the TMX, which is an XML exchange format for translation memories. You want to export your translation memory and give it to another translator or to another member of the community, you use a TMX, which is a standard file format. And, uh, the last format worth talking about is the PO, which is uh, the, prop the property, the specialized file format for the get text library, which is a GNU tool, and uh, is the one that uh, you put the strings into, and the software is expected to find the strings in that format, uh, so any, anything that uh, uh, compiles with the get text library is able to be localized in this way. When you start localizing a project, you look for the get text PO files. How not to do it? For example, iOS and Android are long-standing offenders because they came up with their own proprietary file formats, which is the localizable strings and the strings XML. And uh, there are tools uh, to convert this stuff to the PO format. So the standard workflow is that you, go, you come with an original file, you uh, put it into a cat tool or a cat server, and that generates an XLIF container, which is the envelope of the original file. Then you query the translation memory or machine translation, and you fill all the content uh, in it. At any time, you can export the container to an XLIF file and send it to a, an independent translator to have it translated. This is particularly important because you don't want to send the original file. You don't want the, developer, the translator to gain access to the original file, which may be reserved, uh, which is translating to. 
Also, the file may be uh, so big, they want to split the load uh, among 10 translators. So you have a 10 small XLIF file with uh, 10 parallel pieces of stuff. Anytime you can uh, export translation memory in a TMX uh, or the machine translation in a model file you want to deploy somewhere else. And at any point, uh, uh, you can take the XLIF container with the strings that have been translated until that point, uh, repackage back them into a translated file, which is the thing you want to go back to your customer or to the community if you're working in a project. So today uh, we are showing the, our cat tool of choice is MateCat. MateCat is an enterprise grade, completely free and open source, web-based cat tool. And it has been funded by the European community in the seventh framework program. It costed three million euros and two years and a half to develop. It started with the four people team, including me, for the very first release. Uh, it's uh, currently, uh, it's uh, open uh, software, so you can find it on GitHub. And it's uh, evolved and, oper and operated as a service uh, by Translated, which is the company that took the, um, the tender to develop this technology. And so now I'm showing you this. So today I'm bringing you here, uh, there is the hosted version, but the hosted version is not really interesting. So today we are deploying that uh, on our laptop in real time. And this is the first thing I'm bringing here, which is a uh, Docker MateCat. Uh, and it is uh, actually uh, a, re a packaging, a proper packaging of this tool as a Docker container. So it's easy to deploy that. So uh, it's really easy, you just have to uh, clone and uh, issue these uh, really small commands. So in this case now we are, whoops, let's start bringing up the MySQL container. Let's then bring up, uh, let's initialize the MySQL container, testing if the container is connected. And there we go, okay, everything is up. So. My keyboard just switched to English, thanks to them effect. And now we're bringing up uh, the rest of the tool. Uh, I've started with some uh, settings, uh, but you are free to customize everything. I try to move uh, everything from the build time at runtime, so you can just change the runtime va variable and uh, the tool uh, changes accordingly. The only thing uh, which is really nasty and uh, can be improved here uh, actually is that uh, it, uh, it expects you to, it runs only on Chrome, but that is by design, okay. But uh, it expects you to have a dev.matica.com for a matter of cookies and to have to find the API uh, domains that is hardwired in a configuration file. And you I will make sure you can change your runtime in a later version, but for now you just add the devmatecat.com into your lo localhost because uh, uh, your PC must know where it is. And this is the Catool interface. So here you can uh, upload anything. And uh, I'm starting with this uh, Docker and Kubernetes presentation, which is a file in English about Docker and Kubernetes. And let's just load the, know that it's a, oops, sorry, this is my fault because I forgot one thing to change the permissions. Otherwise, uh, they are complaining. So the file has been uploaded. Now it's been converted to this uh, intermediate representation. This supports over 72 file formats, so all the Office stuff, uh, strings, uh, uh, CAD, uh, as a really, really uh, big uh, array of uh, formats. It does the conversion for you and packs back. So. It's really nice. Now we start analyzing, and uh, ah, of course uh, I, you can sign in with the Google account. I put my, develop, uh, my development uh, keys in here, and uh, now it's uh, complaining that this app is not verified. Uh, this is, it's a development environment, don't worry. A nice feat that this tool has is that it can uh, scavenge for you your docs from Google uh, Drive and have them translated and re-uploaded back to your drive, which is really handy. Now it's analyzing uh, all, the, all the words uh, in order to show, uh, to um, find for uh, duplicated content, uh, so you don't have to translate something twice, uh, and uh, for, translate, so for matches into the translation memory, which I have. 
and we just open the workbench. So here you can see I've, uh, I've partially translated some stuff, so it's locked. I cannot touch it until I unlock uh, the string. But never mind, because there are other strings here. So for example, I click here, and I get a suggestion from a, a machine translation server, which in this case is Google Translate. So we can just uh, uh, accept the, the translation or not. So the new containers, we don't translate the containers in Italian. Then we translate, and it goes to the next one. Ah, see, here we have the tags. These tags are the formatting uh, of this uh, PowerPoint. So the problem is that this string has been, has been is in the middle of a, a tag, which maybe is bolded or maybe is italic, and I have to make sure that uh, uh, it stays there. So for example, Spring, deploy your Spring application. Spring in this case has been translated as Primavera, but uh, is absolutely wrong. And in this case, uh, uh, Spring application are in between the two different uh, tags, uh, two nested tags. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm leaving there as it is. So it's trying to guess all by itself. Come on. Okay, accepted. Um, I can go over and over and over until all the, the strings have been translated. Need space to store your images. Okay, fine. Any, anytime I can download the preview of how is it going, and it's just uh, downloading the file. And if I open it, you can see it has been translated in Italian, while all the formatting has been preserved, which is pretty much impressive. And there we go. So uh, a critical part, all is good, but uh, for the most of my time here, I've been relying on machine translation server to suggest me the correct sentences. This is because I just had to accept or edit the suggestions. This gives me a big uh, productivity boost. But no matter how much data we translate, we'll never have enough memories to reuse for the new project which is coming. So machine translation system is here to actually fill the gaps, which are always more than you have. Uh, machine translation are machine learning systems that are trained over data sets which are named parallel corpus or corpora. Parallel corpora serve as a bidirectional label data set. A, bidir a, bidirectional, a parallel corpora is a, a very, very, very long list of sentences in one language, for example, English, and then a corresponding list of those sentences in the foreign language I'm trying to translate, for example, Italian. So I have one million sentences in English and one million the same sentences translated in uh, uh, Italian. And it serves as a bidirectional labeled data set because I show an English sentence and then I show the corresponding Italian sentence. But I can do in the opposite direction. I want to start from Italian to English. I start with the Italian uh, string and I show as a label what, what you should uh, come up with, the English string. The problem with uh, uh, this uh, thing is that you have to feed this machine learning server. You have to come up with a lot of data. And this has been particularly made worse by the advent of the neural technologies. The neural machine translation, since it's a neural network, it requires a lot of data, which are in the hundreds of millions of aligned sentences, okay? A lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. So since the technology is pretty much the same for all the players, uh, the winner is the one who has more data, which namely is Google, always. That is the only uh, really serious provider of machine translation technology. All the others are niche players who pretend to be very good, but uh, Google Translate actually is uh, the top-notch player. They started first, they crawled a lot of data, they aligned a lot of data automatically or with manual efforts to bootstrap, then they really uh, came up with uh, billions uh, of words. So the problem is that we, uh, we have to 
uh, find this data. There are efforts to procure parallel uh, data for free, which is the Opus, which is an open source parallel corpus. Uh, and it's a collection, uh, an open collection of uh, parallel corpora, which you grow every day. For example, they uh, crawl pages in different languages and align them. Or for example, they take books and they align the sentences the, even though they are not exactly the same translation because liter literature translation is not really the same. Uh, for example, you know uh, a book which is really, really, really easy to align? The Bible. The Bible is uh, as notation for all the versets uh, and uh, all the uh, different chapters uh, is the most alignable uh, book in the world. And it has uh, all the languages in the world. So although its uh, way of uh, uh, writing is a little old, it, it uh, works very, very well. But the problem is that we have uh, enough data to uh, come up with a decent translation system because we can just use this stuff. There are millions and tens of millions of sentences in this open corpora. But just for figs, which is French, Italian, German, and Spanish, if you have another language, for example, Norwegian, or uh, Sudanese, uh, you have no way of uh, coming up with a decent machine translation system. You just have n not enough resources, not enough parallel resources. So we are st uh, uh, stuck at a dead point because the technology we have is, is uh, very good to come up with uh, translations, but only for a selected amount of languages. And since those languages are those who can uh, benefit from the presence of a translation industry, there are more and more resources are created in those languages because more and more documents and interactions are produced. And, and so the more and more data they have, it's a virtuous circle. And uh, the same can, uh, doesn't happen actually for Norwegian, uh, Italian Norwegian, for example, or Japanese, uh, Hebraic, because uh, there's no uh, interaction with the Japanese culture and Hebraic culture, so you don't have uh, an aligned data set. So you say, okay, what if we have a Japanese English and then English uh, Hebrew, we can do uh, like a pivot, we translate from Japanese to English and then from English to Hebrew. Yes, you, and you lose a lot of uh, uh, fidelity. Because it's like uh, uh, we have Italy, we have a, a game, I don't know how you call that uh, abroad, is the cordless phone in which you, you say a sentence into an air to somebody else, and then the other has to tell to another in a ring of people. And then at the end, you have to uh, just to, uh, you have fun uh, knowing what is the sentence that has arrived. Doing a pivoting in machine translation is really the same thing. So you're just uh, taking the output of a machine system and feeding it into the, uh, another machine, which will add a lot of distortion. And so you will not, we, you will not be very happy because uh, your translation will suck. So let's just maybe, uh, maybe since we are in a dead end, uh, we may take a step back. Uh, the dead end comes from the fact that we have a supervised system that needs labeled data. What if we just go with unsupervised training? Unsupervised training is a particular kind of uh, a class of machine learning system, which is not concerned with uh, finding uh, correlations between uh, a data and a label, but finding a hidden structure into a corpus which is not, has no label. So in this case, we don't need the parallel examples to learn a language. It's not the way humans actually learn a language. So we learn Italian, when we are, uh, or we are our mother tongue language, and then we learn another language, but uh, separated from Italian. It's not that they just uh, relentlessly show us examples of uh, all, all the lore that we can uh, come up with in our mother tongue language, and they just uh, throw at us uh, English translations for me, uh, I'm Italian, until I, I learned English. I just learned the English separately, and then uh, I start uh, doing my mapping between the two languages. And then we can do actually the same. How about learning two languages and then try to map between concepts, which is easier because it's easy for me just to get a very, very vast corpus of, of just Italian, just Norwegian, learn those independently, learn a, a model of how those languages are structured, and then try to put uh, some uh, links, some bridges in between when I mastered the two languages. The problem is that uh, we are dealing with a machine. So in order to map within, between languages, uh, 
a computer needs to build a representation of that language and how can that be accomplished actually? We may use language models. Language models are technology that uh, allows a machine to uh, come up with a structure, a hidden structure, because we're just uh, uh, showing it uh, uh, data samples and not teaching the rules, and builds a model of how a word relates to another. And word embedding is a, it's a technique that maps every word into a vector space. Remember geometry at school where you have uh, all these shapes in 3D environments which are vectors. So uh, these are uh, an array of numbers and uh, we can, the, when the numbers are close, two vectors are closed in space. Words with near meanings uh, will have near vectors in that space. So, uh, for example, uh, I don't know, Paris and Rome will be near in the space of uh, the capitals because uh, Paris will be and Rome will be very far from Milan, for example, because Milan is not a, a capital city or anything. So Paris, Rome, Berlin will be very near and uh, Milan maybe will be near Frankfurt uh, among the, the dimension of all the cities who are not capital to anything. Uh, boy uh, and uh, man will be near because they will be on the dimension of the type of sex. It will be a dimension of just two, uh, two numbers, actually, like a binary dimension. But anyway, we have these uh, very big vectors of 300 dimensions, uh, and we come up with a way to map from a word to this uh, stuff. And we can do even crazy things. Since these vectors and numbers, they actually uh, allow us to do computations like uh, you take the vector of Paris, uh, you subtract the vector of France, uh, and uh, there are numbers. You then add the vector Italy, and what you get uh, is a vector which is almost the same as the vector of Rome. And this means that uh, if you, we analyze enough sentences in one language, uh, we start to develop a very structured model of how that language works internally, which is a language model, our language model that we need. So, uh, we could uh, induce a parallel corpus between the two independent languages by just mapping concepts between spaces in latent spaces and we can bootstrap with a vocabulary for example we have a vocabulary for italian and norwegian and so we know which some words translate into another and you can start uh, you can just bootstrap from them and then you can start mapping similar concepts or you can just use uh, unique entities uh, and frequencies. So the, uh, the article, has the very same frequency as the Italian uh, uh, corresponding article, which is il. So uh, you can, uh, home has the very same uh, frequency I can expect in a corpus as casa in Italian. So uh, we can just use these as heuristics uh, to guide our mapping in this very big uh, Latin space. So a uh, very, legit question is, won't the result be really, really, really noisy? Because uh, you will end up with a lot, a lot, a lot of false positives. Yes, but we could use statistics uh, to compute means uh, and among uh, how many times uh, uh, house uh, seems to align with dog or to casa uh, and infer the true positive, uh, uh, throwing away all the false positives. And here comes the phrase-based machine translation, which is, what, which is the old technology that was a completely scrapped away when we came up with neural uh, machine translation. The phrase-based machine translation uh, had uh, revolved around the concept that uh, co-occurrences of words uh, are significant, uh, are statistically significant, sorry. For example, you see this character here. What do you think uh, is the translation of that character? shrimp because it's the only character that occurs always so you can uh, uh, assume that this is the translation of shrimp and uh, this is somewhat uh, broccoli if you happen to uh, meet broccoli again in a word and uh, you another sentence and you just see this one uh, maybe this is broccoli and this is a, a particle like uh, some some connective that it's used it's uh, uh, peculiar to the chinese language 
And this is the way uh, we used to train uh, the old Google Translate. Now Google Translate is narrow, but in the old times, uh, it was uh, based on this technology, which is a toolkit, uh, an open source toolkit, of course, which is called Moses. And it's been developed by uh, University of Trento, University of Edinburgh. So the co-occurrences counts between words and sequence of words, because uh, uh, I've been at school, School can align with scuola in Italian, uh, but also I have been, it's a sentence that is alway, always translates in sono stato in Italian. So I can always uh, count not only the co-occurrences of words, school, scuola, but also I've been, sono stato. And so I count the phrases, and the phrases I treat them as a unit of translation. And that is subject to co-occurrences counting too. So uh, I can use those to calculate the translation probabilities. A probability is just uh, the idea that seven times out of 10, casa is observed to co-occur with uh, house. And that's a probability. So I can just come up with the probabilities and choose the most probable sentence among all those who get to be aligned. These probabilities are always annotated in a database, a special database, which is called phrase table. Creating a phrase table is the most expensive uh, operation of phrase-based machine translation. So the Moses toolchain is based on three technologies, which is the language model, YESTLM or KNLM, is the language model that calculates the probabilities of a sentence being meaningful. Then we have the aligner, which is Giza, and later was superseded by FastAlign, and Moses, which decodes the incoming message. Moses projects the input sentence over a phrase table to retrieve translation options. Searches among all the different options guided by the language model as a heuristic, and then stops all by itself when all input sentence has been covered. And today uh, we are presenting the second technology, which is MONOSES. MONOSES is, uh, is stems from the, the paper from these three uh, scientists, and uh, it's basically a toolkit to create a phrase tables from two monolingual datasets through word embedding. Then it creates a, a Mo Moses model with this uh, noisy thing does some fine tuning and then iteratively augments the data set by translating itself. And uh, so uh, you can start with 1 million sentences and you rapidly go to 10 million sentences because you uh, try different combinations between uh, sentences that you have started with. It's noisy, sure, but uh, the sheer amount of data that you come up with uh, uh, ends up averaging out the noise in the long run. And this is what uh, I brought today. So the second demo that I'm showing you today is Moses. Uh, my, my small contribution uh, has been packaging this really, really wild uh, research prototype into a Docker format so it's easy to deploy, it's easy to use. Uh, you have uh, the, the pipeline to train, so you just uh, take uh, two big uh, text files uh, with all Italian sentences and all Norwegian sentences, for example, and uh, these sentences must not be related to each other. You just uh, take Italian Wikipedia and uh, Norwegian Wikipedia or all the news set of, uh, for the Norwegian, for example, and you stash in two separate files. They don't have to be parallel, they have to be monolingual. Then you launch the training, passes a week, and uh, when the process is finished, you will have uh, several gigabytes of files in, inside this training directory, which is the models, the phrase tables. And then you can launch this translation server with the, full, uh, with the following syntax. You have to point it into the directory of the model. And you can now query uh, your server with the following. So you have this uh, API, which is another thing that I've built, because Moses has no API server, per se. So I built a, a Flask-based uh, Python HTTP API. Uh, please know that you have the verb here, the query, which is Ulver in this case, and uh, the source language. Did I say Norwegian and this is Swedish? Yes, this is because uh, Moses doesn't have a Norwegian tokenizer to analyze the sentence, but Swedish is really close, so I used uh, the Swedish tokenizer, sorry about that. And the target in Italian, and uh, since this server is actually online, I can also provide a working demo here. It's really, 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 really slow because in this first uh, version, 
it tries to load the model in memory uh, each time it's run, and then the, the memory is thrown away. You take another sentence, is there loaded in memory another time? It, Ulvert is the translation of Wolves in Lupi. And uh, these are JSON uh, output that you have here. So, yeah. Now, I'm, uh, in order to show you how this thing works, I have to go here. And then uh, select Swedish. Then I go here. I try to disable the lookups because uh, I'm purposely fully uh, using a wrong language. I have to fix this uh, uh, someday so I don't get suggestions for the Swedish. And then I add the empty engine. I as choose as the provider Moses because uh, I try to imitate the Moses. Uh, uh, HTTP proprietary API. I tried to just implement it. I add here, oops, engine name, which is uh, Monosys, okay. And this is the server. I keep, you just type a dummy, you don't need it. Okay, now we have to look for uh, um, a file which I have somewhere and I actually forgot uh, where I uh, stored it, which is embarrassing. And uh, I think uh, <laughs> I lost that file. So, okay, I know I have a Norwegian file uh, uh, right now to show you, but the idea is that uh, you will end up uh, with a very, very, very uh, uh, slow server that will uh, uh, actually provide uh, translations. Uh, uh, to you, not the a, a Google Translate uh, speed, uh, very, very slower fashion, and the translation are uh, not even perfect, but are good for a starting point uh, to start translating your software. And the advantage of this uh, is that you don't, uh, even if you are Norwegian or Sudanese, so you have uh, a very, very small presence uh, online uh, in terms of uh, amount of data produced and parallel data produced, you, with this kind of technology, you can just throw it, throw in it uh, enough data from books, uh, from uh, articles, from uh, cooking recipes, uh, the, uh, from subtitles of uh, movies, and that you have the, uh, a lot of. If you go in Opus, uh, the parallel corpora, and you take all, only the monolingual part uh, that you are interested into, then uh, you might be able to actually uh, build a very, very huge uh, model. Proof is that uh, I've launched the, 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 the model that I show you today. It's just a test model with a few data. The serious model for Italian Norwegian has been running for five days and hasn't finished the training yet. Uh, so uh, I cannot really show it to you because uh, it's just training on a 50 core machine has been running from for days on 50 core machine. It's not looping. It's just that uh, it, uh, it does a really, really, really long uh, refinement process. Uh, so it uh, induces this phrase table, takes uh, 10 hours, builds the first model, 20 minutes. Then uh, starts doing some fine tuning, uh, some parameter fine tuning, and this takes appro approximately another hour or so. Then goes to the monolingual corpus, uh, translate it with the model it has built, uh, and generates two parallel corpora, because it goes to Norwegian, applies the Italian-Norwegian model, and generates a, a corresponding Italian translation, and does the same for the other. And then now you have two very big parallel corpora that are used to augment the rough model that you started with. It's like a bit heavy training. You bootstrap it with a rough model and use yourself to improve your own training. So if you uh, uh, supplied, uh, like me, 700 millions of words uh, to this model, it takes a long time to translate 700 millions uh, of stuff. Uh, then you do another fine tuning and then you do that again. Iterative 10 uh, tuning iterations for three iterations of tr back translating all your corpus from scratch takes a, a ridiculous amount of time, so uh, I hope to actually post some updates on how the experiments went, actually. So, in conclusion, today, uh, what we have here, so we have a Docker packaged version of Monoses, which is ready to use to generate a training set. 
We have an HTTP API server to query the model obtained this way, and it's all available in this repository. And then we have a packaged version of Matka tool, which includes also MySQL server and ActiveMQ uh, instance, uh, various daemons to perform the analysis uh, uh, and the translation in the background, and Apache 2 web app uh, with a PHP, a very uh, humongous PHP web app. Runs in Docker Compose, but I aim to support Kubernetes, so you can just uh, deploy that uh, anywhere and uh, you can start your own uh, uh, very, very small LSP at home for your uh, open uh, projects. Kudos to uh, the four knights, which are those we are portrayed in the cover of my presentation, which is Philip Cohen for inventing the phrase-based machine translation, Thomas Mikolov for inventing word to vec which is the, uh, the mapping and the language model with those vectors, Adam Paschke for inventing PyTorch, without which we will be never be able to actually train anything narrow, and Michael Arteche for putting all together and be the author of the paper I took inspiration from. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, are there any questions? Is the faces of the people. The cover is Sgt. Pepper Lonely Heart Club Band. Yes. What about uh, the construction of the phrases? Because uh, we have seen uh, today that, uh, for example, in Italian, uh, the, uh, there was uh, a word before another word. Yes. And, uh, yes. Yes, so uh, your colleague uh, is asking, uh, when you translate uh, uh, a sentence which has some markup into another language uh, who happen to remix the, the words in a different order, the tag formatting uh, is not preserved because, uh, for example, you may end up with a, a sentence between tags uh, which is split into different sentences with something foreign in between. Then you should duplicate the tags. Uh, uh, so this is a problem that has been uh, solved uh, by uh, Christian Bach, which is a, a Google Brain uh, scientist uh, and worked in the University of Edinburgh. And uh, he basically um, employed a trick. So he factorized all the tagging. If you have a, a sentence, uh, uh, five words are tagged, you put tags in each separate five words. So you multiply the tags uh, so that uh, each single word is between, is bolded independently. Then you translate, uh, you let those uh, uh, be remixed. Uh, and then if you happen to have uh, in the target language a sentence with two tags, you can collapse them in two words between one tag. You solve that in that way. This technology uh, that I have developed doesn't feature that trick, which is uh, uh, one of the first things I'm going to add, actually, because uh, it's a very uh, naive, uh, trick but it works very well actually and so I will uh, scavenge that from the Matecat uh, project because the Matecat project, uh, this Matecat uh, means machine translation enhanced cat tool and uh, it shipped the original project when it was a research project with an array of uh, uh, little stuff like this uh, who actually improved a lot the, the quality of the, of the engine. I will try to go back uh, in the old uh, repo when it was a, a research project and pull th those back in. Now I've developed from scratch uh, because it was just much easier to, uh, for the purpose of this conference. But you mentioned that you don't need uh, parallel corpus to train uh, monologues, but I imagine if you would use the parallel corpus, it would be training uh, taking a lot faster because it's going to be uh, Okay, uh, if I, so your colleague asked, uh, you don't need the parallel corpus to train monoses, but what if you happen to use two monolingual corpora, which is in fact two parallel corpora? Um, will it be easier or faster? Uh, not faster, but it will be less noisy. Less noisy, because uh, you will end up with good quality mappings, which uh, usually they end up for being very noisy when you uh, use monolingual corpora because you end up with a lot of false positives. If you happen to use a parallel corpus, those mappings end up for being high quality mappings. So your training uh, is actually of a better quality.
you end up with a better model with less noise. And so you have to spend less time doing fine tuning, a back translation, and you don't have to create this really, really, really huge amount of data only for the sake of a Monte Carlo sampling that averages out the noise, leaving the good stuff in this place. Uh, I, don't, I think I didn't understand the question. Yeah? So uh, all of these files, uh, which is the, RT, the office, uh, the document, the Excel, uh, Excel uh, PowerPoint, but also web pages, uh, but also uh, scanned files, uh, it's true only if you put an advanced uh, filter which is a property of translated, and it does OCR or PDF. Uh, you can also just translate directly a TMX or an XLIF, and also uh, desktop publishing uh, stuff, and various localization formats like the properties and the, where, where is, where is the strings. So all these thing, whenever you put something in, an XLIF is generated uh, behind the scenes, which is the envelope container, all the strings get pulled out and they are inserted in a temporary location. When you translate, you replace those strings and then when you do download or preview, those strings get packed back into the XLIF. The blob, the file, uh, is just a, a matter of replacing uh, placeholders and uh, packing uh, all the binary in and you end up with a PowerPoint or a, or a docx file uh, in the end. Add another file format. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, uh, the real question of your colleague was uh, what is the process of adding another file format? You basically have to uh, uh, implement a new class behind, uh, which is the class for that file format. The idea is that uh, uh, the interface expects uh, here's a blob, give me the, the XLIF strings. So you just have to implement uh, that kind of uh, uh, process. It might be really easy, for example, if it's, uh, I don't know, uh, YAML or JSON, because uh, you just have to, com you can come up with a template XLIF and you convert uh, uh, a JSON into an XML uh, in the format XLIF. So you can just take the strings and you paste those uh, in this uh, kind of format. If it's a more advanced uh, format, uh, and I, I'm coming up with the most difficult format out there, which is the AutoCAD. AutoCAD is a total nightmare because uh, it's undocumented, it's uh, heavily binary, and uh, the strings uh, are basically uh, shredded everywhere in the thing. Then you have to come up with something that uh, is able to read the strings, uh, place a placeholder in the original file, and you pack this into an XLIF. And then you construct the sentences out there. I can show you an XLIF because uh, it's not really difficult once you see it. it Here we are. Come on, Wikipedia. So as you see here, an Excel file, uh, you have, uh, you should have a, a very big blob, which is the binary basis 64 encoded version of the file with the placeholders already put in between. Then you have uh, units, which is a translation unit, a sentence, which has always a segment with a source and a target. So for example, unit two, segment, an application to manipulate temporary access document. And here you have the corresponding target. This file is all from English to Japanese because of this uh, header here. And then you go down and you keep having units, segment, source and target. Units, segment, source and target. This is the very basic uh, unit of work. So if, if to come up with uh, another way of producing uh, an XLIF from a proprietary uh, file format, uh, you have to come up with a way to construct this XML. Once you have the sentences, it's really easy. You can compose this XML and it's easy. The very difficult thing is that uh, starting from this stuff, uh, you just have to find a way to 
take out strings, put a placeholder in it with the ID of the unit you have here, and then you have to base64 encode and stash it here. Uh, let me just show you a real one, because since we are in... Uh, I can show you this uh, a real example of something we have here. Uh, no. This is a PowerPoint. <laughs> loading, loading, more loading, okay. So, here you can see the translation units, so this is the XLEF version 1.0, the one I show you on Wikipedia was the 2.0. Sorry for the mismatch. Yeah, it's my GPU is crunching. How big was this file? In the meantime, I'm just, okay. Set, wrap. Okay, here you can see, this is the base64 encoded file, the PowerPoint file encoded as a base64. If I have, take this one and do a decode, I can see the, the binary uh, PPTX. Woo, man. <laughs> You can see the editor here at the 100% CPU. Okay, and uh, here you have all the different uh, translation units. Uh, when you have uh, the source, Docker and Kubernetes, uh, and uh, with the segment source and the target, uh, Docker and Kubernetes has been basically uh, generated as a copy of this one. So whenever, when you translate, you actually write here, you write onto the uh, database and when you export, uh, you pack all the original strings uh, in the place of this one. You can see even the tags here, the G tags that were showing inside the, uh, the editor box. This is a very nasty file format uh, with a very uh, heavy documented standard. You just uh, use this as a working uh, table or as a workbench and then you when you have all the strings, basis 60 go decode this one. Substitute of the placeholder, which point to a single unit, save the blob uh, as a file, and you have uh, hopefully uh, translated uh, file format uh, output. This is the most complicated uh, process uh, in extending this cat tool. But it has been done for each show of these formats. Any other questions? Sure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I chose Italian-Norwegian because uh, I knew there, uh, there were not a lot of uh, resources, uh, some, just some millions of words. For example, Italian-English, which is huge, is uh, 80 millions of sentences. Then, times 10 for each other, you go, go 80 and tens millions of sentences. Uh, Italian-Norwegian uh, has... Uh, 12 millions of sentences, 6 millions, and then because I was listening to Ulbert, actually. Uh, that works, it actually serves. The lowest one which doesn't work, it's Sardinian. I tried to translate in Sardinian, but with 10,000 sentences, it's impossible to go up with a mapping with 10,000 sentences. You need some millions of words, but it's easy because you just need to crawl uh, Sardinian websites, uh, Sardinian books, uh, and uh, stuff. Uh, it's not difficult to find the monolingual corpora. The real challenge is to find the parallel corpora, but this technology turns the problem into scavenging monolingual corpora only, which is uh, the more content you can just crawl in just one single language, totally unrelated with the other language you want to crawl, it's just an easier task. Yeah, so you say that there's uh, enough Sardinian content on the web already to find millions of sentences. Yeah, Google has it. Sure, like Google Books, for example, uh, they have uh, crawled and aligned the one billion words in various languages with Google Books. And that is the top source of the uh, translation quality. The, 
when you um, actually are on Google Maps uh, and you bark an, a random address uh, inside uh, Google Maps and it understands you, that's because it has a, a one trillion word language model built. It's just so much data that uh, it, oh, it's always able to understand you because he's always uh, seen something. So in a Norwegian works, uh, the model I wanted to uh, show you is still training. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but the idea is that uh, it takes always weeks of training, but uh, in the end, you will uh, end up with a model trained on a lot of data. Moses, uh, since the Moses is the last chain of the, the ring of the chain, it's not the best uh, translation uh, software um, uh, server out there. It has been superseded by the narrow machine translation, which is much more fluent. But uh, since Moses is uh, phrase-based, uh, the counts uh, are made uh, as uh, discrete uh, counts. So it's always able to come up with the probabilities, uh, even in uh, absence of uh, huge data examples. It's uh, uh, it's a discrete system opposed to a continuous in the mathematical sense system for the neural networks. The transition quality is lower, but it has a score of 26 uh, in a blue uh, scale, which is the scale for translation quality. Google uh, with the neural achieves the 40 points, which is outstanding, but 26 are okay for start translating, to start drafting. I think our time is up. Thank you so much for attending here. <laughs>